whether I want to do it on my computer, whether, whether, um, oh, did you set record already? Yeah. Good. All right. You're probably going to want to stop it. Otherwise, you're going to get the whole preamble and everything else. Okay. I just, I just activated it. Okay. All right. Um, so anyway, you know, that's where we're at. And, you know, it was, a, you know, in 2005, we transitioned really from that, that conventional way to, of doing things to a more organic, natural, and ecological way. And having looked back, uh, to me, there's, there's really no other way of doing it. Um, and obviously, native, native plants are, are, key, are key to that scenario. So that's what we're going to talk about this evening. Um, I'm glad you're all here. So we're gonna we're gonna touch on reducing the lawn, right? There's a lot of a lot of talk about um, lawns and how pro how how, um, how productive are they? Are they not? Um, are they more problematic? You know, do you use a lot of leaves and gas and things like that to blow them off? Is that a, is that you know is that a problem? And we know it is. There are a lot of people that want to you know do away with those kind of things and and there are strategies to minimize. Uh, those, those gas powered pieces of equipment and reducing the lawn is one. And obviously we're gonna to wanna to replace that lawn with native plants. We're gonna talk about rebuilding native plant communities. Um, we've done a lot of damage to our ecosystems um, through uh, loss of habitat and installing large home, home communities and parking lots, et cetera. So we're gonna talk about how we can, on a residential level and even commercial level, can start to restore those plant communities. Um, and obviously key to that is the ecological powerhouse of this is the native plants and the that, that sort of go hand in hand with those plants. Um, so the big reason why we want to reduce the lawn is we've, you know, we've out, out kicked the, the earth's carrying capacity, you know, a couple times over at this point. Um, we've degraded the earth and, you know, some of the ability to support us. And we've exceeded the earth, like I mentioned, the carrying capacity. And we've had five great uh, extinction events. And we, as humans, humanity walking this earth, have initiated the sixth great extinction. And you know, if we don't change the way we do things, um, we're gonna have a big problem. And the landscape industry gardeners, and, and you know, whether it's a, a weekend gardener or whether it's a you know a nine to five or you know nine to five wood landscape contract to work nine to five, a seven to a seven to seven or seven to eight o'clock landscape contract, um, we all have a hand in this and we've created the problem and, and we can certainly fix it. Um, only 5% of lower 48 is considered pristine. 95% of the country has been log drilled, paved, and this is what we're talking about when we talk about habitat, uh, that fragmentation, and to the detriment of all that are, are, you know, are native species of plants and avian species and insects. Imported species, we all know we have issues with, with all kinds of in, in invasive species, plants and diseases. Uh, water quality is not great at this point, and we've drained our aquifers. And if we're following the rules of green infrastructure, following rain gardens and things of that nature, we can certainly help that issue too. If we or reducing lawn areas and things like that, so we've got 40 to 50 million acres of maintained lawn uh, in this country, and my guess is not even a tenth, one one hundredth of a percent of that might even be organic, um, probably. Um, 40% is residential, 20% lines roadsides, 3% on golf courses. So, you know, from a percentage standpoint, golf courses, while they are, you know, they do spend a lot of time spraying pesticides and they are a big habitat fragmentation issue. They have ways of getting around that, um, you know, obviously going organic and planting na native species and, and doing the things that the uh, Autobahn would, would help. Them. Um, you know, golf courses are on their way to make it better also. Uh, again, public parks, fields, other green acres, um, tons of pollution in the atmosphere from our from our lawn mowing equipment. Um, and each lawn mower generates as much pollution as driving a car. Um, ridiculous distance. So, um, again, that's why we want to reduce the lawns and incorporate these, these native plants into our into our property. If you were to, you know, look at a bird's eye view of the way the, the United States looks, I guess that's how it looks in percentages of lawn to to, to manage landscapes, um, pavement areas, impervious surfaces, and things like that. So, we, we yeah, if I could, if I could just jump in, Rick. Um, yeah, the amount of acres planted in lawn far outseeds the amount of acres planted in corn. Yeah, yeah, right. And, and so, you know what, Barry, while you jump in there, it just made me think. So we'll get to a point here. Um, if anybody's putting questions in the chat, 
you see anything that we might want to answer, Barry, we can do that. When we get about halfway through, I'll give you a nod and we'll see about yep. that. Otherwise, we'll, we'll, we'll field the questions at the end. If, if anything comes up that's pertinent, we'll jump in. Okay. Right. Yep. Um, so in 1947, we, we began the, the suburbs, the, the onslaught of the suburbs into, into the United States. Um, Levittown, New York was, was one, of the, one of the issues that we first had. And I'm so just looking for my wife grew and, up there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's you know, and that's that's a perfect example right there of habitat fragmentation. It's not a farm, granted, but you know, you take these communities and now, now they're just littered all over the United States. Um, you know, but you know, there's hope. We, we do have issues, but there's hope. There's the boys out there cutting the lawn with their first gas-powered mowers. You know, you can see they're cutting that lawn real close. Um, they all seem pretty happy right there. I think the guy right there on the, on the left-hand side, on the far left, he might even have a pipe in his mouth. So, you know, the old school, old school way of doing things. Uh, the current view that we have of our landscape is, is that of an anthropocentric, anthropocentric view. It's where we are utilizing the earth, um, the, the availability to take things from the earth and utilize them at a rate that, that is not going to sustain us. Um, you know, it's a viewpoint of where we are looking to the earth to not to work in concert with it, but to use it and manipulate it the way that um, we feel is, is gonna benefit humanity. Instead of looking at it from a standpoint where, you know, we need to work in concert with the earth and, and nurture the earth. Um, we're just taking everything we can from it. And if we don't change things, we'll be, you know, we'll just be a satellite orbiting, orbiting the sun. We might as well go inhabit the moon because we're gonna be growing everything out of greenhouses under, under under roofs and living in bubbles because there'll be no more e ecology on this planet to sustain us. So we need to change our plans for it. Uh, so you go from Levittown to, you know, current state of our landscape in New Jersey. Um, and we, when we look at landscapes like this, you know, they're, they're, they're managed neatly, they're maintained well um, from an aesthetic point of view, but they do nothing from a standpoint of ecology. Um, you know, they're loaded with berberus, chemisiparus, um, the turf grass is more than likely not organic. It's, it's probably synthetic. Um, and when you see things like this, you know, you, you, you immediately know that there's, there's no ecology working here. And if it is, it's very minimal. Um, so this is actually, this is from our website. This is my view of, of the landscape industry and, and how we've sort of posed this problem. I think to me, the problems that we have are generated by the landscape industry by poor utilization of designs basis. Um, we look at things from a point of, you know, if a customer asks for something, instead of educating them on why that might not be the right idea, why do you want to put a, you know, Mr. And Mrs. Smith, why do you want to put a, a, a white pine tree right on the corner of your house? Well, the soft in the corner, yes, but Mr. and Mrs. Smith, do you know that that pine tree in 40 years is going to be 60 feet tall and you're going to have to take it down? So that's when you start to lose the idea of the ecological and carbon sequestration and things like that, because Landscapes are built to be replaced. We have to start looking at landscapes as, from a standpoint of they're here for the long term, you know, not that we're going to be getting rid of them just because something outgrows its space. We need to, uh, you know, take into account for that in our, in our initial, our initial. Um, the plant, plant material is mostly selected for the characteristics of aesthetics and not ecological value. Um, you know, does it have a positive or negative effect on the ecology? Um, most of the landscapes that we're working with uh, now um, that are not in this, you know, ecological maintained space, or really, you might as well be looking at a, a painted picture on the wall because they do no more for ecology than in a painted landscape on, on the wall on somebody else. Um, and we need to get away from that. Um, again, Berberus, synthetic lawns, Bradford pears. Ecological wasteland. What happens when you plant those those plants in the landscape? They get loose. Um, this is uh, Berberus thunbergii, that you know in the fall it's got some great fall color, but other than that, it just takes over over our our woodland spaces. And once we once that happens, we lose complete control uh, over what's happening there. And with the degradation between deer and these invasive species, you know we've almost completely lost our our native. Or Berberstum burgii, same result. 
Um, and these invasive species will also change soil structures and characteristics of soil so that they are more conducive to them growing instead of the native species are in these are that are in these areas. And if you like native species, here's a nice tapestry of uh, Euonymus solatus, Herbert Lombrigii, and um, uh, so if you're a fan of invasive species, you got a nice layered effect of all those awful, awful invasive species that we need. Um, Bradford pear is another one. Um, you know, the conventional thinking is, well, it's in my landscape. I don't see it in my landscape. It's not going anywhere in my landscape, but well, you turn and turn around and look at the landscape behind you and it's jumped because the birds are taking those seeds and flying over those, those open spaces where nobody's maintaining them and dropping those seeds with a nice little packet of fertilizer and nobody's going to manage that and all those, those invasive species. So how are we going to change things? Well, we need to rebuild our landscapes. You know, is it, is it restoration or conservation or regenerative landscaping? Um, to me, it's more of a con uh, conservation landscaping. It's not really regenerative. Um, if we want to do a regenerative landscape in the Northeast, we wouldn't do anything and we'd be back to the hardwood forests that we had here 100 plus years ago before, well, even more than else, you know, a couple thousand years ago before we started taking trees down to build, build uh, you know, residences as well. Um, to me, it's more conservation, right? Because we've lost those woodland spaces. We need to bring that conservation and bring that ecology back. And the only way we can do that is in our residents and in our, you know, in our communities, we can rebuild those plant communities, reestablish um, the, the native plants and the native insects that, that may specialize on some of these native plants. Um, so what's a native plant? Just real quick from the USDA NRCS, um, the United States Research Conservation Service. That's their description and I think that's pretty good and I think something that's key about their description in here is that you need to have that geographic qualifier, right? When you're talking about native species, you have ecotypes and ecoregions that are all, um, that are all important when you look, you look at these places. Um, so all that, all those things are important um, when you're looking. That's a, that's a pretty good definition. Uh, Aldo Leopold, I'm a huge fan of his. Um, John Muir and, and, and Neil Wilson, another one who just passed away, unfortunately. Um, but we need to come up with a new land ethic. And, and really, that's what we, the way we need to start looking at things. Um, you know, and his, Aldo Leopold's land ethic is simply enlarges the boundaries of the community to include soil, water, plants, and animals. So we're looking at the whole landscape as a whole system and not just one piece of a puzzle. Um, and again, it's one of the biggest things we have, the reason why we're planting native species is because of the insects. Uh, E.O. Wilson in his book, The Conservation of Invertebrates in 1987 called them the little things that run the world. And like I've mentioned, we don't have these insects, we won't be here. Um, the ecological diversity is hugely important um, moving forward. You know, no sweepies, no pollinators, no skippers, no, go no golden flitteraries. Um, no polyphemus uh, moths, no, you know, no white line, no white line uh, sphinx mole, anything like that. All these things are going to go away. Some of these are specialists. Some of these need a certain type of native plant to pollinate and to feed on. Otherwise, you know, they're not going to make it. So we need to have that diversity in our landscapes um, to nurture all these, these native insects that are, that are helping us out with our ecosystems and the ecosystem services that our landscapes are supposed to be preserving and offering, I should say. How are we going to do that? We're going to do that with keystone species, right? The most important thing we look at when we're looking at our landscapes is the keystone species when we're incorporating uh, native plants. And the king of all these, these native species is, is the oak. Um, the, the white oak, or the white, white uh, I should say oak species, will uh, attract 513 different species of Lepidoptera, that's caterpillars and moths. Um, and you think about that in the scope of one oak tree that size, you know, back in the days when we were spraying, um, the damage that we that we probably done to the ecosystem. Um, another reason why we're not spraying is because we have ladybugs, we have ladybug larvae, we have uh, brachionid wasps that that parasitize and and the, the insects that are problematic in our landscape. Um, you know, so we have all these things here. We need to nurture them so we don't have to spray these pesticides on our properties. So again, like I mentioned, when I came up. 
in the early days, I started as an arborist and we were spraying tree canopies for leaf chewing and sucking insects. So if you go back and you think about those pictures I just showed you of all those, you know, and these are just Lepidoptera species. This is not true bugs. It's not really, you know, it's not bees. It's just Lepidoptera species, 513 species of caterpillars on that one white open that, that, that screen that was just there. If I was spraying that canopy with pesticides, you know, just think about the damage that, that, that was done from the 1960s when we started using synthetic chemicals up to now or the 80s when we started using IPM and things like that. So we've gotten better, but we still have a long way to go. Um, so again, reducing the lawn, all, all of the insects are, 90% uh, of the insects are considered, considered specialists, which means they need a certain type of plant to proliferate. 37% of the animals on the planet are insect herbivores. Large percent of the world's fauna depends on insects. Um, so if I keep pausing, I'm also admitting people here as I'm going along. So if I'm speaking awkwardly, that's why I get the admit level, uh, the admit sign here as, as I'm talking. So if I pause, that's why. Um, and again, our turf grasses, they're not certainly not native species. They will sequester some carbon, um, but they're not. They certainly don't do the carbon sequestration if we're looking for that, that a native planting would do. Um, that's in place, not moved, that's sustained for a long time. It's not cut down seasonally. Um, or not seasonally, but you know, once a year or not. Uh, novel ecosystems. So if we had another 10,000 to 20,000 years, these invasive species that are now proliferating in our, in our woodlands would become a novel ecosystem. At some point, the, the insects that are here would adapt to those, uh, those ecosystems. But as it stands right now for the very near future for, you know, for us and our, and our grandchildren and, you know, future, um, for humanity, we need to make sure that these, these, these native plants are, are reintroduced into our landscapes um, with to bring that diversity. And, you know, with that evolution, it's, in, it's important that um, with, the, with the native insects and plant species that have evolved over time. Um, again, we need to manage these landscapes as a whole system. Um, native plant populations, pollinators, and beneficial uh, insect diversity. Uh, and reduce those problematic areas that I was talking about. I mentioned habitat fragmentation. Farming is also a big part of it. Um, again, Levittown, New York in 1947 was really where all this got kicked off. So what do we do? This is a crude outline of one of our properties um, that we had installed. Um, that's the before picture. So in most cases, you know, if you can see, if I have my cursor here, in most cases, we're going to, you know, a lot of landscape contractors do a foundation planting here. They'll put a pathway, <clears throat> the driveway. Doubtful, very doubtful that, you know, this would just be a strip of lawn. If they're, I doubt very seriously, there's a bed here. Um, more than likely, lawn goes right up to all the wood edges and things like that. So we have about 20,000 square feet on this property, not including the residents. Um, and we have seven, what's left over is about 7,000 square feet of lawn, and we've got about 5,200 square feet in these boundaries, these, these real crude red areas um, of native plantings. So, you know, we reduce the lawn area, we give the client, they do this from children, so they have some space in the back uh, for the kids to play. Nine times out of 10, kids aren't playing in the front yard anyway, unless it's a massive front lawn, but, you know, we, we speak to our clients to make sure that they do have enough space. We're not just going to, you know, go throwing meadows in everywhere where, where a client wouldn't need them. Um, there is a give and take and certainly you have to manage that. You have two white oaks here in the front. So we're, you know, accommodating that, that large Lepidoptera population on that property. Um, and that's the ground floor. That's the ground floor level. That's what, that's what we have there. Uh, Echinacea purpurea, we have um, Rebecca subtomatosa, uh, little blue stem, some more carpus is in there. Um, Sleepy's tuberosa. There's there's a lot of different diversity in there. Um, we'll, we'll we'll talk about eco regions too um, in just a second. Um, it could be very simple planting, you know, lawn space like that, tiarella and things like that. Do a fine job covering covering the ground, um, or you could take it to a greater extent. If the client doesn't need a lot of space, and you can have you know gardens like this. Um, and what I can do, Barry, later is uh, this, this actual property was. Um, we had the NJNLA come out and record a, a two segments for for their uh, growing greener program uh, this past summer, which might be interesting for folks to see. I can send you that link and you can put it in the show notes uh, after after this is done. So, 
Um, I'll send it over. But this this was, you know, this this is prime time right here. Um, Echinacea purpurea, there's uh, Anthem muticum, there is some, you'll see Canadian goldenrod in here. And we leave that and we just weed it out if it, if it gets to be a little um, a little much. You know? So we'll take those things out, but we don't like it. Have to be a small space at the beach, um, which is what this is. You know, it, there's no point in having a lawn, lawn space here when you can when you can install your native plants. It could just be in a little little space on the side of your property. It doesn't need to be a big space. Every space will harbor pollinators. So another great thing that we're doing is we're working with the Calumet Group Home Grown National Park, um, which again, this gets back to the connectivity of these, these native plant species and how we can, and how we can sort of bring everything together um, as a group um, and Homegrown National Park will do that. And they will do that by putting your zip code in. If you put your zip code in and you have a, and you have a native planting um, and become part of their map that will begin to show uh, how much space we're trying or how much space we're getting back from a, from a native plant standpoint. Um, so currently, this is this is a pretty recent uh, screenshot. There's 52 states that are involved in this, as you can see. <clears throat> We've got 24,000 um, acres of landscaped native plantings. And we're looking to get about 20 million. So we've got, got a substantial way to go. Um, you could drill down a little further. Uh, there's 20 active counties in New Jersey, and every dragonfly mark on here is a mark that is part of Homegrown National Park. Um, the folks that have um, gotten on here have, have taken the initiative to put native plants on their properties, and, and it shows the connect and connectivity of, of that. Rick, I, I, I have to interrupt because it doesn't go far enough south to show my house. Hold on. Well, there's another shot, so it, it's better. <laughs> yeah, it's close, but anyway, you know, this drills down a little further. So here's Princeton, where we do most of our work um, in Mercer County. We've got, you know, not a whole lot going on there, but, you know, we're working on it. Uh, 12 plantings. The, the, one of the problems that, that I'd like to speak to the, the folks about this is, you know, we have, we, we count as one, our company. We're one of the eight. We certainly have multiple properties. Um, so it would be nice if there would be a way outside of us having to account for every property, if, if we can, you know, work out some way to, to, to do this more simply so that we can have all our properties up there registered. Um, so let's talk about ecoregions real quick. <clears throat> so when we talk about native plants, we certainly do want to deal with ecoregions. Um, you know, eastern temperate forest, we're, we would be the, the number eight there on that, on that map. Um, so when we started to utilize native plants, we sort of looked at our region of, um, you know, if, if we wanted to use a native plant region, we sort of take the, the Mason-Dixon line up to the Great Lakes around to northern, the northern United States and down back to along the Atlantic seaboard as our sort of ecoregion. Um, and remember what that, that geological diversity in, keeps in mind here. There's a lot of different soil types. There's a lot of different hardiness zones, um, things of that nature. And you know, so you have to be cognizant of that, <clears throat> um, cognizant of that when you are doing your plantings. Somebody, I just admitted somebody and I lost my place. Um, so, you know, ecoregion is impossible, or is, is, is important to look at. Um, ecotype, plant ecotype, um, is, it, is it, you know, wet obligate, is it upland, you know, all those different things need to be, um, you, you know, viewed when you're, when you're making your plant selection. Um, plant culture and plant, right, plant right, places is extremely important. You need to do your due diligence as far as um, So a great way to find native plants is to go to, the National Wildlife uh, Foundation um, Federation, and you go to their website. So the really cool thing about this is this is also this was also done with Dr. Doug Talmy. Um, you can put in your zip code again. <clears throat> so I put in our zip code down in Princeton, and this is the screenshot of what comes up. Um, you'll get your uh, goldenrod is the top producer of Lepidoptera species, 121 you see there, and then it goes down the line, helianthus, Joe Pieweed, etc. Um, but what this does is this gives you Native plants that are local to your zip code, right? So you're not guessing. All the guesswork out. You do trees and shrubs also. Um, and again, you see oak here, 513 species of Lepidoptera. Um, and again, they just count, um, as you can see here, uh, discover native plants at the top. 
uh, discriminated plants ranked by number of butterfly and moth species. Um, and here's a list of his list of plants: Quercus prunus, uh, willows, birch. You can see all, all the sort of top uses of forest tree goes, trees go, uh, saldegos, uh, symphoricorpum, asters, trichomes, sorry, asters, um, and things like that. You can see that the uh, the perennials are much lower on the scale of attracting. Um, uh, pollen specialists because I mean those numbers are higher the numbers are greater so if you're attracting 50 different species to sunflowers that's a greater number of pollinators so you know it may not be 436 maybe 50 but that's a higher number there's a higher number of pollinator species uh, than there is in in lepidopter species so let's talk about replacing some of these these uh, invasive species with some of our keystone species obviously Norway maples we want to get rid of and what better to replace them with and our Quercus alba. Um, you know, Pleasuratus Kentucky is one of my favorite trees. It's a beautiful tree. It does wonderful things for pollinators, but it attracts zero Lepidopter species. So, you know, you have to choose your plants appropriately. Um, what do you? What What is the key? What are you trying to do with your with your landscape? And, and what are you trying to? You know, you want to have diversity, and we're looking for seventy percent. Optimally, we're looking for seventy percent native plant species. Um, on our landscapes. Um, boxwoods, as we know, are definitely problematic. We have a problem with leaf miner, boxwood blight. Um, we have all kinds of issues with that. So if we're going to replace those, you know, we look to Ilex glabra. Um, 45 species of Lepidoptera are attracted to that. Um, and when you start to drill down into that website from um, NWF, um, this is what you see when you click on inkberry. Right, so if you go to Inkberry and you click on that, it's the pawpaw sphinx, floral sphinx, um, polyphemus moth, like I mentioned before, and these are all sort of the things you can go through, scroll through these pictures, to see what um, what exactly these plants are, are going to attract on your landscapes, and then you need to start looking for. Them. That's the fun part of it, right? To me, that's one of the really fun parts of what we do. Is it, it's really a great way to communicate with our clients. We're always texting back and forth um, photographs of, in particular, monarchs because they're easy to spot. Um, monarch butterflies and their chrysalis and the caterpillars and all those things and their kids are out in it, you know, and it, it's a way for, for us instead of like looking at the landscapes from the house and not being a part of it to get outside and stop looking at it through the window be a part of it and get gone back into nature. And so just, um, I mentioned Bradford pear before we know they're obviously an invasive issue and they're also a, a very weak structural tree. Um, so we certainly don't need those. So Hawthorne critigus, um, vertus is a great replacement for that. Great for, for late season feeding of birds um, because it holds its fruit real long. Um, it does have some issues with some fungus problems. So, um, you know, you have to start, and, and same thing with our oaks. Our oaks have issues also too. So, you know, these are, you know, pros and cons we have to, we, we have to deal with, but we can't stop planting our native species just because we have these issues. Um, it's important that we plant them even though some of them may expire because when you get that genetic, especially if you're going to a nursery that grows from seed. Um, if you're going to a nursery that grows from seed, you get that genetic diversity in, 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 the, in that seed. So, you know, it may be that you, we stumble across a genetic um, mutation in that seed or a genetic change in that seed that at some point maybe ash trees aren't susceptible to um, emerald ash, um, you know, things like that. So if you stop planting them, and I'm not talking about you know root cuttings and and or cuttings and, and grafts and grafts and things like that. It has to be from the seed, otherwise you don't get that genetic diversity. Um, it's important that we continue to do that, even though we have issues, you know, with bacterial leaf scorch with oaks and and sudden death, sudden oak death, things like that. Still need to keep planting. So at some point, you know, evolution takes hold, and, and that ecological diversity uh, outcompetes some of these diseases. So, um, so I have winter king highlighted here in red. <clears throat> That's a cultivar. Um, so we have issues with cultivars. Do we use straight species or do we just use cultivars? Um, certainly, we're not going to use non-native species if we had to, you know, had a choice over um, a productive, a productive native species versus a, a a cultivar like winter king. You know, we may take winter king because it does have that, that genetic. Um, or not genetic, but that that bred um, fungal, a little you know a little bit of that fungal resistance that that we're looking for. Um, 
may not attract 150 species, right? Where, where the, the species of hawthorn would, um, but nevertheless, you're gonna get some, you're gonna get some diversity in your landscape. Again, you're gonna call in birds, pollinators are great for these, you can see flowers, a load of flowers. These are sort of the, 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 the things we have to play with as we're picking plants for our landscape. Um, we're gonna take a look at some installations here and I wanna leave about 15 minutes. All right, what do we got for questions? Are there, are there many questions here we're gonna to have to talk to or talk about later or? Um, we could, we could know, also, most, we could also most the, yeah, most of the things yeah. coming up on the chat box you've covered. Um, okay. So I'll, I'll just, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Cheryl did ask, uh, you know, what inspired you to start taking this path? Uh, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it was, uh, it was a confluence of a few things, right? I, I had noticed um, when I was managing landscapes for uh, my previous employer, employer, I had noticed some things that weren't really working well in the landscape. Um, plants were struggling. Um, we were managing landscapes, you know, conventionally with synthetic fertilizers and, and, you know, doing a lot of annual plantings, not even necessarily for perennial plantings, you know, a lot of plantings with tropicals in, in garden beds, you know, the, the typical laying out of begonias in beds and things like that. And, and, and they struggled. Um, and it took a couple of you know, Barry walking onto a property asking, why don't you do things organically? Um, a couple of things hitting me over the head, realizing that, you know, why are the leaves so small? Why are the leaves off colored? Why are the colors of the flowers muted? These kind of things that I was noticing that shouldn't be. Um, and then once I met Barry and we started talking about doing things organically, then I realized how important the soil was in soil biology. I hadn't touched on here at all, but I can touch on that a little bit. But it was really that realization that soil and soil biology is the key to everything we're doing and what we were effectively doing working for my previous employer um, was you know we were killing soil biology by using high soil fertilizers um, planting in soils that were sopping wet um, doing things now that I would you know doing things then what I that I would never do now um, you know we'll schedule things differently um, and work around things differently it's just um, but it was really seeing things going wrong and then you know, the initial conversation with Barry, um, taking courses with Milfa, folks up in Connecticut, and then a lot of investigating on my own. So that's a great question. I appreciate that. Oh, thank you. That was really how we how we started down the path of, of doing things organically and ecologically. And, I and, and, and I'll just have to say in the past couple of years, um, with Rick pushing me, <laughs> I've been doing a lot more native plantings on my own property. I don't manage anybody else's property. Um, I don't follow all of his instructions, but th this year it was just so amazing, not only to see the beauty of the plants, but all of the insects and butterflies and hummingbirds that came around that we just didn't see before. So, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I think once folks start to, to take this path and, and they realize that, you know, it's, um, you know, ecology is not a feeling, it's a science, you know, where, you know, we talk about some of the things, you know, we've had conversations about bands and things like and whatnot in our industry. And those, a lot of those bands, some of them are emotional, right? They're a knee jerk reaction to not liking something. But the one thing you can't argue with is ecology. And the ecology is a science. And once you start to see that science actually working on your properties, um, it makes a huge difference. In, in so, I'm glad you're enjoying your property there. Or listen to me more though if you're not listening so that's not, that's not such a good thing so all right so we picked that property um client wanted to install a rain garden um which we happily did and removed the turf installed our rain garden first season that's probably the middle middle part of the first season the initial installation was um in i want to say early april ish so that's why we put a lot of smaller stuff in plugs one gallon containers and you see how fast when you use small plants how fast they actually do grow um, so we've certainly certainly taken the approach that we can get a lot more bang for our buck and get a lot more productivity into our clients landscapes if we're using smaller plants and using more of them instead of using five um uh rebecca seven subatomic so posts of the yellow yellow flowering plant here um you know we use a flat of 72 or 52 um, and, and really cover that ground so that we don't, obviously there's some bare spaces here, 
but our goal is to get that ground covered so we you know keep the weed pressure down so we don't have to get in there and do our weeding um so rick i'll interrupt you because because rick just um put a great uh, i mean dave they put a good question here and it's it's one thing it's plagued me for a while um mm -hmm. what's a good website to identify native plants for our area um so the the nwf the, the, the slide that i had before um and i actually have a couple at the end if you want you guys can take some screenshots when i start to wrap up i'll let you know when we're wrapping up and take some screenshots of some of the information i have there but um jersey friendly yards if you're in new jersey dave i don't know if you're in new jersey or not jersey friendly yards has a great database and then also the nwf.org plant finder um is a perfect way because with the nwf.org plant finder you actually do put in your zip code um and it'll give you your, your local um your, your local native plant species good question thank you uh no, another rain garden here that's the before picture so you know these are hemlocks what, what do we do with hemlocks we spray them with dormant oil we spray them with imidacloprid um we do all these kinds of nasty things just to keep them looking decent when you know we can you know, we can install that rain garden and get all that good ecology happening um not to mention the fact you know having that water recharge the aquifer you know if i had to put an estimate on how much water over the past five years our company has had a hand in recharging, we're probably somewhere in the 10 million gallon range of what our rain gardens have, have reflected and infiltrated uh, back into the aquifers. Um, you know, so you put a couple of these around and it starts to have, have an impact. It, it, you know, and, and they're, they're multi, multi-faceted, multi-dimensional parts of your landscape. And they don't need, and I'll show you in a couple of slides, they don't need to be a focal point. They don't need to be one thing that stands out. They can be a part of your landscape. You, know, you build your landscape around it and you don't even know it's there. Um, oh, Rick, I'll, I'll interrupt you again. Um, Karen yeah. asks whether New Jersey has a native plant society. I think you might have answered they that. Do. Yeah, New Jersey, uh, New Jersey Plant Society, New Jersey Native Plant. So yeah, yeah, they do. Um, yeah, if you if you Google it, I, I don't. I'm not. I, I'm not a member or involved there, but I know they do have one. Um, Okay, so one of the things I love to look for is the life cycle of some of these insects that we're talking about. Um, in that rain garden, you know, I, I was lucky enough to be there one day taking some pictures and, and you know, doing a site assessment of the property. And I found the monarch butterfly right here in the center. Um, and I followed it around and I saw it land on a leaf. And sure enough, I went over and turned that leaf under. And if you look at the one leaf here on, I'm not sure what side it is, but one leaf here, you see a little white spot. Right, you see my cursor? You see my cursor right there? Right. And the monarch just laid the egg there, which is pretty cool. So you get the whole life cycle. Right. So there's a fourth instar monarch here. There's a chrysalis where the monarch just emerged from. It's just I mean, if, if you're doing work like this and you don't wake up in the morning and jump in your truck and run to work, um, something's missing. And I think that's there is a big part missing to our if, if there's industry folks listening, there's a big part missing from our industry um that deals with this right i mean it's bottom line get stuff in get it done and none of this stuff matters and that's something that really needs to change in our industry um so there's a you know native planting winter landscape <clears throat> so how do you maintain these things uh we got about 15 minutes okay um so how do you maintain these these new sort of ecosystem landscapes instead of Cutting everything down or moving all that good ecology well we cut stuff down and, and leave it light we leave the plant stems up uh, about eight inches ten inches sometimes more um, a lot of those pithy hollow stems will have overwintering uh, insects in them or and or for our solitary native bees that will use these spaces for their for their nesting sites in the summertime uh, and there you go that's going on um, so what we'll do is we take our shears battery powered battery, battery powered shears um, and if we have a plant that's three or four feet high, we just cut it, you know, in two or three pieces, let it lay on the ground. And, you know, by April, the, this, this is starting to get covered up. We don't have to, we don't have to worry about the debris on the ground and it just becomes part of the biology and the biology as it breaks down the soil. Now, this is not for every property. Not every client is going to want this. Um, you know, these, this particular property was, the clients are very open to the idea of fostering ecology. They have two young kids and, and, and they really like the idea of getting out to the landscape and 
looking around and seeing things happening out there. So they're really all about it. It's not every property that, that this will that this will work on. So you have to know your client, you have to educate them, and you also have to be, as a property manager, um, know where you can make these allotments and have thresholds. For so Rick, that, that leads into a question I, I do have for you, where you've, you know, over the years, you've certainly changed your whole approach to landscaping. Um, and you've been very successful. I, I just want to know how you go about talking to new clients um, and get them interested and excited about the ideas that you do. So I'm, I'm sure you um, get a lot, a lot of calls say, you know, I, I just want some grass and I want this and that, and and you kind of push um, them over. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a there's a there's a limit to a, a couple of things. It, it's it's a couple levels levels here. So our marketing markets to people that want this kind of work, right? We market to people that want organic turf care. We want people that work for people that want rain gardens and things like that and want native species on there. You know, if nothing else, they call us and say, we want monarchs on our property, right? Because you know, everybody everybody knows we need to save the monarchs. So that's sort of a, a gateway plant or, you know, gate, sort of a gateway drug into, into native plant species. And that's how you can start that, that discussion about doing more. Um, if, you know, a lot of it does go back to marketing. We don't, we are fortunate enough that we don't have a lot of folks because of our marketing um, come to us in the pictures that I showed previously of those landscapes that are barren um, with non-native species that, you know, have grass that's nuked to the, to the hilt with synthetics. We don't have a lot of those people unless they want to transition completely come to us. We don't have to have that, you know, there's not that grinding on, on philosophies. It's everybody's pretty much in, in line with what we're doing. Um, and, the, and the education of what we're doing goes pretty easily at that point. That's the question, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and, and right along with that, you know, I mean, you, you've created a niche where you don't have that much competition. Growing, which is good. I mean, that's, yeah. you know, yeah. I, I welcome it. You know, I mean, the more people that are doing work this way, that just means more people are getting involved and, and it's better for everybody if, if that competition. Um, so just moving on here, we're starting to run out of time. I still got a few slides when I get, and, and I see there's some questions. That pop. Um, so this is that landscape from a distance. Our spring cleanups are, like I mentioned, cutting back that, that herbaceous material, just touching up the edges with a little bit of mulch so we're not wasting our clients' money on, on you know, 40, 60, 80, 100 yards of mulch. Um, it's not needed. That's what that property looks like roughly in June, you know? So everything is cut back, it comes up, you don't see any of that debris on the ground, and it looks fantastic. Another view. Um, so looking at that, that uh, NWF list again, if you think about the things, I'm just gonna talk about how these, these landscapes are again, important to have these, these keystone species on your, on your properties in the landscape. So if we take a look at this one property, uh, the plant material that's in here, the swamp sunflower, 65 species, Lepidoptera, and this is not pollinators. You know, these are just Lepidoptera species. Eupatoriums are monsters monsters as far as calling in you know pollinator species and and parasitic wasps I, I you know in our in our organic turf management we haven't put down crop control since we started using native plants because we you know the in particular i've noticed on the eupatorium species it, it, it brings in tons of scoliated wasps and the that species of wasp parasitizes the grubs in our in the lawns so the ecology and those thresholds of grubs Rub issues that you have to worry about, they just don't exist. Um, fungal problems, minimal, you know, all these things just work. Yeah, so just touching, getting back to the, the, the Lepidoptera species here, the Symphory trichum, 11 species, um, the woody here, the fragrant sumac, 59 species. Um, you know, so diversity is great. Just because you have 65 species on one and 59 on another doesn't mean they're gonna be the same. And you could have a couple of specialist species instead of generalists. You know, generalists will feed on anything, um, and, and some of these some of these specialists need certain plants to to, to proliferate. So you need to have that diversity in your landscape. This picture here is actually <clears throat> 500 square foot rain garden that, over the course of five years, will infiltrate uh, to uh, approximately two million gallons of water. Yeah, and I could go back actually because it is just off to the left side. <laughs> it's hard. I can't tell what side your screen's on. Um, 
so if you were looking at this, you have the purple, the uh, physis teach the purple flower in the foreground, up to the side of that, where you have that sort of white billowy flower um, is the Eupatorium, that's where that rain garden. Um, so again, it fits in the landscape. It's not a feature, it just fits right in there. Again, that's, you know, 2 million gallons of water. Um, so here's a project, rain garden installed, new sod, um, new fence we did, really relatable talking about. Um, and there's the plant list. If you want to take a quick screenshot of that, that's the plant list that's going into that property. Um, we're going to do another spring plant probably this year. Um, it's a pretty good list, I'd say. You know, it's it's pretty diverse. Uh, there are different cultural aspects here. There's some sunny sunny areas, some wet areas, um, obviously some shady areas. So it's a it's a pretty pretty good diverse list of climate you're going there. And if anybody wants these, my email's at the end of the second service. Send you these at the end. Um, this is a permeable walk, right? In that in that one landscape. Another permeable wall, right? So we're talking about green infrastructure, native plants, infiltrating water wherever we can instead of having to run off. And of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention our our move to electric battery powered equipment. Uh, so this year, we we again we worked with AGSA, the American Green Zone Alliance, um, and they helped us become New Jersey's first um, AGSA green uh, certified uh, contractor. Um, with that, real quick with the electric stuff, it's awesome. The mowers are great. They are quieter. They do. They do still make noise. You know, this is a whole nother talk. But um, you know, they're still. They do still make noise. Um, string trimmers are fantastic. Uh, the AGS is great if you are a contractor looking to get in to the battery powered uh, segment of our industry. Um, AGS does a thing called certified field tested, where they've gone through and they've vetted um, these pieces of equipment. They've tested them. They've had them out on on contract with contractors. Um, utilizing these tools and, and working with them. And, and you know, if, if they're not good, then actually doesn't recommend, them, right? So it's pretty much. Um, here's the boys out there doing their thing. Uh, question always is, how's the backpack blowers? How good are the backpack blowers? Well, the backpack blowers, the way I communicate that to folks is they are twice the cost at 50% of the output. Simple. They're just not as good. Um, so when, it's, when you talk, it's a work in progress, it is a work in progress. So when you talk about the backpack lower bands and things like that, um, you know, I've done some work with sustainable Princeton and sustainable Princeton, you could look up their ordinance. I think their ordinance is great. They worked with the community, they worked with homeowners and they worked with landscape contractors to put together this ordinance so that both groups were, you know, there was a give and take. I don't know that everybody's happy, but that's part of negotiating, right? Not everybody's happy. So, you know, they a lot, along with AGSA, especially in the Northeast, where you have that heavy leaf fall. In the springtime, you know, you have a month uh, where you can use a, a gas backpack blower, and then you have about six weeks in, in October, um, October into December, November, where you can use the backpack blowers again. And again, it's all part of managing, managing the landscape differently, minimizing your turf area, so you don't have to do these leaf cleanups. So that those areas that I'm showing you where, you know, we're cutting, cutting debris and leaving it lay, these leaves are being left in those beds, right? So if you minimize your lawn, you're gonna minimize the amount of, of gas powered or, or electric powered equipment that you're using. Uh, the question came up, how long do the batteries last? Uh, again, this is a topic for another day. So the, <laughs> The, the, large, the large lawn mowers, and we're starting to run out of time. We're going to stick to eight o'clock. I, I could stay longer if, if anybody else wants to. So that's, I'm not worried about that. I know we got to cut. Off. Um, just want to get there. Um, so the batteries on these mowers are um, the large mowers that I showed you. We get they're about seven hours. Um, so they go all day. The smaller handheld equipment, um, like the string trimmer I showed you, they get about an hour, hour and a half. Um, but we have multiple batteries and we have, um, we're incorporating solar uh, charging into one of our trailers. So that we'll have a, a completely um, reliant solar charging unit so that we can charge these batteries on the fly. Um, what a lot of people do at this point that are starting to transition to the battery, um, into the battery segment is, you know, you just take a milk crate container <clears throat> with a, a power strip and plug your batteries in as you're working on a property. And just don't forget them when you go to the next site, you know? <laughs> so um, there's a way if, you know, where there's a will, there's a way, but it's it's a very early stages in, in, in what we're doing with all of these things we're talking about. 
it's it's really it's really in its infancy even though we've been doing it since 2005 and you know i have nofa here as a courses and webinar you know nofa they sort of coined the term organic land care back in 1990 and and people were doing it even before that but this big push to do things to have this whole sort of effort is really really pretty new you know within the past i don't know barry 10 5 10 years to have this whole concentrated effort on this really trying to push things forward um so but it's getting better so yeah i mean small stuff hour an hour and a half you have to recharge them um so you have multiple batteries and you take chargers with you <clears throat> the larger equipment uh seven hours and that large backpack blower you get about an hour and a half uh per per, per charge on one of those so you have to have you know you just have to have more. um education is going to be huge to all this moving forward i mentioned nofa um our Rutgers organic land care program the Ecological Landscape Alliance is fantastic. Uh, you know, you go on their website, they're constantly having webinars. And they, all, they you know, they have a backload of webinars that you can go and view. I mentioned the Green Zone, the American Green Zone Alliance, uh, their certification course. Um, Lori, I know you're on this call if you haven't left yet. So the NJNLA, um, New Jersey Nursery Landscape Association is awesome. The NJLTA is also working with us on something. So um, the industry is coming around and it's a real good thing. Uh, another screenshot if you want to take this. Um, if you are in Jersey, Jersey Friendly Yards has a great database that you can go to. The Native Plant Finder that we've been talking about a good portion of the evening. That's the place where if you want to go and put your zip code in, uh, it, 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 that's countrywide. So if there's anybody from Oregon, which I Oregon, if there's anybody there, um, you can put your zip code in Oregon and you'll get your native plants that are there in Oregon. You're in Texas, same thing. New Jersey, doesn't matter where you're at. Um, and Homegrown National Park, again, we're looking at Homegrown National Park to grow those communities um, of native plants and get that, that connectivity that was lost with all our habitat fragmentation and pesticide out. Um, so, you know, to sort of just wrap up here, we need to develop a new land ethic as Aldo Leopold told us. Um, we need to start looking forward to changing our philosophies on how we're doing things. And the strategies, strategies are there, uh, people are doing it. And like I said, over the past 10 years, it's really made a big push. Um, there's there's tons of information and you see groups on Facebook and, and the internet, obviously, and um, lots of education programs. Uh, and another big key is you have to view the whole whole landscape as a living system. It's not, you know, it's not a product for product replacement. Um, you're not going out and spraying if you see a pest. You know, we, we want insects on our properties. We don't want to spray for them. Um, we want to have that ecology and we want to have that ecological balance um, from the soil to the treetops. Um, so what we're looking for in our landscape. Um, and I have questions. If you want to take them, uh, I can take them. If you have questions, that's my contact information. Um, I would love anybody that's on this call to, to follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, um, at our, our, our blog, you call it hashtag, you call it matters, you call it matters. Um, when we put, we put the blog together, we put it together as a, hopefully to be an, a, an educational tool. It hasn't really gotten there because, Know, we're juggling field work with with trying to write articles for our blog so um it's a it's a work in progress so listen i appreciate everybody being on this call today um i hope you found this beneficial i hope it served you well um i thank you all very much Barry. i thank you for, for holding this and a lot of luck in in the future of your uh your listed seminars coming up in the future so um if there's any questions we can go we can take them there i don't know if anybody wants to chat live we can do that if they want to bring them up Barry. you know we can do that yeah, you can do that. Uh, the, I, we cover most of the uh, chat questions. So if you want to open up their mics, go ahead. All right. Just to have to stop sharing. I don't know. Let's see. And while he's doing that, um, so this is a, it was a six or seven part. Um, series. Next week, we have Joe Heckman from Rutgers, uh, who's been very involved in organic, <clears throat> excuse me, organic agriculture. And, you know, look, talk. so he's going to take some of that, concentrate mostly on a soil talk. And so that will also help with your lawn care and, and tree and shrub care. All right. So, um, you know, if anybody has any questions, they want to raise their hand or you just speak up, whichever works. <laughs> John, John <laughs> says, thank you, sir. You are the real McCoy. <laughs> mm. Hey, I have, I do have a question uh, just to ask about uh, your rain gardens. Are you, um, 
bringing the water to it via swale and grating or are you using any uh, leaders from the house? It's both. It's both. Um, it depends upon the site. If the site allows, you know, we'll, we'll take rainwater from, from the roof. Um, if the site is pitched, we accommodate for that runoff, uh, for that surface runoff to go into the rain garden. So it's both. You know, we'll, we'll take it wherever we can get it. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. There were a couple of questions about wasps. Um, mm -hmm. One of them, doesn't it bother the homeowners? And you know, a little bit more on the, the benefits that they have for the environment. Um, well, one thing you have to realize is that the, the, especially the native bees that we're talking about, nine, I, I don't know that number exactly, but 90% of the, the native bees we're talking about don't have that hive protective gene in them, right? They're not honeybees. Um, they're not hornets. They're, they're solitary bees, so they don't have a nest to protect. Well, a lot of these, a lot of the bees that we're talking about, they won't sting you. Um, and I'm not, I'm not suggesting that somebody go out and, and stick bees all over their hands and, or stick their face in flowers and, and, you know, well, Richard McCoy told me I wasn't going to get stung. That's not what, that's not what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> if you want, if you, if you brush against them, you know, 10 times out of 10, those native bees aren't going to sting you. You know, it's the honeybees and wasps and hornets and things like that, that will. And yeah, they're there. Um, but you know, you, you can't have one without the other. Um, obviously we discuss that with our clients, you know, if, if we have, you know, we're, we're sympathetic, if somebody has a bee, um, an anaphylactic allergy to, to bee stings, we make sure that, you know, the one property I showed you where the, where the, where the plant materials, you know, approaching on the walk, we won't do that if we have an issue with a client that has, that has, um, right. anaphylactic bee, bee allergies. Um, so there's all those things that you take into account, but. You know, mo for most most of the cases, you're not going to get stung by the bees that are that are there. I mean, I can't say that I haven't been working in the garden, I haven't gotten stung. Right. We'll go to one last question. Uh, Julie's asking, where do you source your natives? Uh, good question. Thank you. Um, so in New Jersey, we use Sunset Farmstead, um, Pleasant Run Nursery, and Pinelands Nursery in New Jersey. We'll also go to North Creek. Um, so Pinelands, Pinelands in North Creek, we get our plugs from. Pinelands also has small, uh, one gallon, I mean, Pinelands has a huge variety of native plants. Um, they're, Pinelands is really, they're, they're, their work is basically restoration. So they do a lot of work with plugs and smaller plants where they need a lot of, a lot of volume in, 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 their, client, in their client's uh, project. Um, so Pinelands is great, like I just mentioned. Sunset Farmstead is great because one thing about Sunset Farmstead that's awesome is they are neonic free. Um, so anything that you would get from them, you, you know, you don't have that issue that, that some some landscape uh, nursery um, neonics in their in their in their growing of their plants. So um, so Sunset Farmstead runs and run. Um, Pinelands, like I said, Oat Shade is another good one. We we don't go there. I just I know their their work is really good. They don't typically have the volume for commercial growers. Uh, sorry, for commercial landscapers. Um, and like I think North Creek. Anything else? Um, da, da, da. That's about it. I mean, you did a great job as usual. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Rick. And again, thank everybody for joining in. Um, one last thing, um, if you're in New Jersey, um, I would really urge you to keep March 2nd and 3rd open because we're gonna have Chip Osborne come down um, to do his two-day organic landscaping course, uh, which is something he used to do, and he's he's kind of his business model has changed, but he, he's doing us a favor and coming down to do that. So um, NJNLA will be um, hosting it along with TechTerra. Yeah, so, Barry, if I could just do mention, if there's um, uh, contractors that are that are on this uh, call today too. The uh, NJNLA's uh, Toll Pro Expo um, is having their. Right. So to, me, to me, it's it's to the best of my knowledge. It's really the first um, sustainable land care day to, to the trade. Um, so uh, I'll be there. 
Tom Kinesi from Pinelands Nursery is going to speak. Um, you are, yes? Yep. Barry speaking? Yeah, Barry. Um, Dan. Oh, Dan. Dan, Dan yep. Dan. Thank you, Lori. Appreciate that. Uh, Dan May from Agsa, the founder and president of, of Agsa, will be there. Um, and, and we're going to be, we'll have a booth there. So we'll have some equipment there to show off as well, battery powered equipment. Um, and there was one other speaker there, Lori. Do you, do you recall that? Off we the have top Rail of Cabrera doing the um, uh, proper mulching techniques. That's part right. of the sustainable land care track. Yeah. And there were yeah. some questions about the uh, lifetime, uh, life of battery uh, equipment. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Dan, Dan's presentation and certainly him being at the trade show, those questions could definitely be answered there. Oh yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, if you have it, and, and again, that's a that's a great point, Lori. Again, if anybody has any questions about battery powered equipment moving forward, um, Dan is he is just like a, a wealth of knowledge about this 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 segment of our of our industry. Um, you know, he he started question about Dan, right? So he started back in in the early two thousands. Um, as a, as a, you know, he started conventional just like everybody else did. And he started a sort of Frankenstein together battery powered equipment when, you know, with cords and he was experimenting with different kinds of batteries and things like that. So, you know, he's taken the way we took the approach to go <clears throat> biological and organic. He's taken that approach with battery power. Um, and he's, he's, he, he really is the authority on, on, on battery powered equipment. So yeah, if you have any questions, certainly, you know, Right. Up and go to yeah. exit. And and uh, so the Total Pro Expo is in Edison, New Jersey, and it's uh, February first and second. Thanks, Lord. Okay, are we done? Anybody else have any more questions? Okie doke. Thank you all for attending. I hope to see you next week. And thank you, Rick. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Have a good night.